You know, as churches today, we are accountable for our actions before God, and God will view us as individuals in the church, but He will also view us as a whole in the church. We're going to study about a church today in Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, called the Church at Ephesus. And I hope that you'll stay tuned as we notice some responsibilities and some rewards in this church in just a moment. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. And now, Josh McCrary, the gospel is gold. There were some church members who were going to get together and have maybe like a rummage sale or a yard sale. And anyway, they posted in the bulletin, they said, do not forget our rummage sale. It is a chance to get rid of things that, you do not, that are not worth keeping. And then it said, bring your husbands. <laughs> well, you know, to them, it really wasn't worth a whole lot, I don't guess. So they wanted to get rid of it in implying something very, very important. And I want you to ask yourself today, is Christianity to you like, one of those things that you just say, hey, it's not that important? What about the church? Is the church something that you value to be very important? Because God values the church. In fact, in Acts 20 and verse 28, the Bible says that He purchased it with His own blood. In Ephesians 5, 23, uh, 23 through 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. You see, he really values the church, and I want to ask you, how do you feel about the church today? Is it something that is valuable to you? We're going to study about a church in Ephesus, as recorded in Revelation chapter 2, that really uh, sort of has lost its value. You know, the members there have left their first love, is what the Bible says. There are some things that they did right, and there are some things that they did wrong. And we're going to talk about those things today. I want to introduce this text by going to Revelation chapter 1. And it's interesting how this book begins because you'll notice that John wrote in verse 12, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks and one that walked in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now you say, well, what in the world is he talking about? Well, thankfully, he tells us exactly what those candlesticks are. Those candlesticks, as he mentions later in the chapter, are churches. Look at verse 16. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. You look at verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So he tells us exactly what it is. He sees a vision. John is seeing a vision of seven stars, seven candlesticks, and, and what it is, Jesus is walking in the midst of these seven golden candlesticks, and he has seven stars in his right hand. And he sends an angel to each congregation of those seven churches. And that's why when you begin in chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, to the angel of the church at Ephesus, write. So, each church is represented by a messenger. The Bible calls them an angel. What that means is messenger. And each of them has a message to each congregation. And what we're going to do is talk about the first one today, the church at Ephesus. I'm reminded of what they call a leg line. If you go on stage to perform, and if you cross the leg line, that is where people in the audience can see you at that point. So if you're behind stage, you never want to cross the leg line unless you are a performer. So it's interesting that before people would go on stage, you know what they would tell them? Break a leg. <laughs> you know, they're not telling them to go out on stage and hurt themselves. No. What they're saying is, you're breaking the leg line. Do a good job is what that means. That's where the phrase came from. 
Now, when I look at these congregations in Asia, as recorded in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, I feel like that's what God is telling them. He, he is speaking individually to these congregations, and He says, I really want you to do a good job. I want you to break a leg, if you will. Revelation chapter 2 We'll begin in verse 1 and look at verses 1 through 7. If you're there, I want you to read it together. And I hope that you'll start with me now. Unto the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Notice. I know thy works and thy labor, and thy patience, how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and how thou hast tried them that say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience for my name's sake, and hast labored and hast not fainted. Now that's pretty good, right? You've done a lot of good things. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come to thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate." He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. And to him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So we've got some good things, but we've got something really serious too. In fact, God said they had fallen away. And Jesus said, if you don't repent, I will remove your candlestick. The church is not the building under the steeple. It's not the views or the pews. It's the people. Church is not something we do or just a hobby, but it's within you and you are His body. There were no denominations in the first century church. Purchased by God's Son is the only one, so do your research. His blood is free for all who have misbehaved, but there is a plea to all who would be saved. Notice his blood is in his body during your search. Then and then again, make sure you are in the right church. Friend, I hope today that you are in the body of Christ. According to Ephesians 5.23, the Bible says he's the Savior of the body. That's where his blood is. And if you want to contact Jesus' blood today, you're going to have to obey the gospel so that God can add you to the church. According to Acts 2.47, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. They didn't join. They weren't voted in. But in Acts chapter 2, when the church began, they obeyed the gospel correctly, and God put them there. And I hope that you are part of the right congregation, the right church, scripturally speaking. Number one, I want to talk about this church. Let's talk about the authority just for a moment. We'll give you all these start with the letter A. Number one, let's talk about the authority. If you look here in your text in Revelation chapter 2, you'll notice that it says uh, in verse 1, These things saith he who holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of of the seven golden candlesticks. He said, I know thy works. You know what Jesus is telling them? I have the authority over this church. And I'm walking in its midst to see what these members are doing. Do you think that Jesus still does that today? I believe he does. He is still looking down from heaven and he still knows the works of every congregation that's in the world today. There was a boy who was trying to baptize his cat. <laughs> and the cat wasn't having it, you know. The boy would try to put the cat under the water and the cat would just claw and scratch. And Finally, the boy had had enough of it because the cat had scratched him up so bad. And 
The cat scratched him and ran off, and the boy said, Fine, be an atheist then. <laughs> well, you know, some people sort of have that attitude, don't they? They, they are not interested in the authority of Jesus at all. It's interesting to me, though, in Psalm 1611, the psalmist wrote, Thou wilt show unto me the path of life, and in thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. It's interesting, this right hand that's mentioned all the time in the Bible, you have it here. He had the seven stars in his right hand. In the book of Psalms, he said, uh, there are pleasures at God's right hand. And what you're going to find is in the Bible that the right hand is representative of authority. For instance, Psalm 118 and verse 16, he said, the, the, hand of the, the right hand of the Lord is exalted, and the right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, when it says, when he had by himself purged our sins and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Well, what he means is that Jesus is set down and he is part of God's authority sitting at his right hand. You know, in Matthew chapter 18, I want to focus on this word, he walketh in their midst. We've talked about the authority and how here in Revelation chapter 2 it says the seven stars were in his right hand, but also it says that he walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. You know, Jesus said, as recorded in Matthew 18 and verse 20, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. I strongly believe that Jesus is still viewing congregations today, and He's still walking in the midst of the candlesticks. He knows if you're involved and ready to teach Bible class. He knows if you're there ready to worship. He knows if you, church is a part of your life or it's just something that you do. Somebody said, don't come to church, be the church. Friend, when you do that, you don't have anything to worry about. It's part of who you are. Jesus knows whether or not the church is part of who you are. You know what Jesus said? I know thy works. He knew, he knew what they were doing. And there were some things they did right. But there was one thing that cost them everything. He said they had left their first love. Let's talk about when Jesus said, I know your works. There are so many, I believe, in the religious world who are caught up on this idea of works. <laughs> you know, And they get confused when they read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, when it says, You are saved by grace through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So to them, that's the only passage they read in the Bible about works. And they say, well, it says you're not saved by works. Well, <laughs> let's keep that passage in its context. What kind of works? He said, you are saved by grace through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What kind of works is he talking about? Well, he told us. He said, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. You know what kind of works this would be? If I'm not covered in the blood of Christ, it doesn't matter how many nursing homes I visit. It doesn't matter how many charities I give to. It doesn't matter how good I think I am. Because Jesus Christ's blood is the only thing that's going to save me. Not my good deeds. That's what he's talking about in Ephesians 2. God has given salvation as a blessing, as a gift. And no man can say that he deserves it. Because his good deeds are not what's going to save him. Okay, That is the key. Works of self. But there's a difference in the word works because you come to James chapter 2 and verse 24 and it says, You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> that seems like a contradiction in the Bible. No, that's a different kind of works. The works mentioned in Ephesians 2 and James 2 are two totally different things. So when Jesus said to this congregation, I know your works, you know what he's doing? He's holding them accountable for, their, for his authority and saying, I know what you're doing. 
I want you to look at Revelation chapter 20. Let's see how God will judge us. Will God judge us according to works of self or works of God? James chapter 2, he's describing the works of God. Obedience. Ephesians 2, works of self. And many people in the religious world, they get the two mixed up. But look here in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12, what God says, how He will judge people. John wrote and said, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, notice, according to their works. The books of the Bible were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And God judged according to works. I wonder what people in the religious world do with those passages who say, you cannot do any works. Sad to say it. They just don't want to do anything. You know, they, they want to squeak into heaven by the skin of their teeth and they want to say, oh, well, God told me I didn't have to do anything. Jesus said to the congregation at Ephesus, I know your works. And I'm going to judge you by those. And I hope today that religious people everywhere will open their minds and study what does the Bible really teach. Well, it teaches, number one, about Jesus' authority. Number two, you look at this congregation, and not only do we see Jesus' authority, but we see His acknowledgments. What good things did they do? In verse 2, He said, I know your patience and your labor how you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tried them that say they are apostles and are not. You have borne and has had patience for my name's sake and has labored and has not fainted. That's some really good acknowledgments. You know, we'd say, well, that congregation, we're proud of what they're doing. How many members of the Tate family do you know in the local church where you are? Maybe you have Sister Agitate who stirs up a lot of trouble, then her husband Irritate, who always hinders a project when it's suggested. Or you have Hesitate and then his wife Vegetate. And then there is Aunt Imitate who wants to be like every other church. And then you have a man named Devastate who provides a voice of doom. Then you have Facilitate, a good member quite helpful. You've got the cousins cogitate and meditate who always really think about things before they do them. Sad to say it, you have a black sheep called amputate who doesn't come to church anymore. You see, the truth is we're all people in the church, ain't we? We've got our own issues that we deal with all the time and preachers and elders and deacons and Bible class teachers and song leaders are not immune to this. We're all human. But friend, I want to tell you, God knows our works. He knows the acknowledgments. Uh, he, he realized their defense. You know, he said, you cannot bear them which are evil. You've even tried those who said they were apostles. So they had the right defense. He, he even looked at their dedication. He said, they had labored and had not fainted. You know, the Bible says that God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward His name in ministering to the saints. And you do minister. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10. So he, he noticed their defense. He noticed their dedication. But sad to say, he noticed their downfall. What was the one thing that held this church back? He said in verse 5 or in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. You know what they did? They quit putting Jesus first. The Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, And Jesus said, You have left that. And you know what happens today? We've got soccer practice and uh, piano recitals and baseball games that come in the way of church. And 
Friend, I'll tell you this. If you take your kid to soccer practice instead of going to church on Wednesday night, I'm sad to tell you, friend, you have left your first love. I don't enjoy telling you that. But you and I have a responsibility. We've got to put Jesus first. And that's what happened to these people. And you know what God told them to do? He told them to repent. Twice He told them that. They had a big downfall. I want you to think about this too, though. Jesus gave a responsibility to churches everywhere, to all Christians everywhere. He said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Have you done that? Do you think that it's a responsibility for you as a Christian to be involved in taking the gospel to the whole world? Friend, it is. And I'm sad to tell you that if you have not been involved in that in some way or some form, you've left your first love. God says when we're Christians, that's the responsibility that we have. In fact, Jesus said in Mark 16, 15, and 16, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And too many times in the church, you know what we do? We say, well, I, I believed and I've been baptized. I've got a ticket to heaven. But you know, we forget about the previous verse that says go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Those who believe and are baptized and saved are the ones who have the responsibility to take the gospel to the entire world. And I want to tell you, friend, if we don't do it, they won't be saved. God will hold us accountable for that. Because the only way that He has chosen to reach them is through you and through me. I suppose He could convert the entire world if He wanted to by Himself. But He didn't choose to do it that way. He chose for us to take the gospel to the world. And I want to tell you, friend, if we don't do it, we're, we're leaving our first love. That's what this church did. They lost their main goal to teach the gospel to the world and put God first. And you know what? They lost their faith. In fact, He said, Remember from wherefore Thou art fallen. Too many times people say you can't fall from grace. <laughs> but friend, the Bible specifically says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4, Ye have fallen from grace. It's very clear. This church had left its first love and had fallen. There was a mountain village in Europe years ago and uh, the members built a new church building and there were no lamps or any kind of electricity. All they had was like lanterns. So at any rate, when they had church at night, they had to bring their lanterns and every person would, would sit there. But the less people they had in church, the darker it would be. The more people they had in church, the brighter it would be. Friend, I want to tell you today, the church still depends on you to shine your light and to remember to put the Lord first. So we've got the authority, we've got the acknowledgments, but let's move on to number three. We look here and we find some admonitions here. Look at verse 5. He said, Remember, therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works. So we've got some admonitions that he says for them that they need to do in order to fix this. And I hope today if you have left your first love that you will realize these three things can be done for you to fix it as well. There was a preacher's heart that was beating out of rhythm and the doctor told him, you know, we're going to go and do some surgery and we're going to perform this procedure on you that will put your heart back beating correctly again. 
the preacher looked at the doctor. He said, while you're in there, can you destroy any hatred, any jealousy, any envy, any evil thoughts, any pride, greed, or selfishness? The doctor looked at the preacher and he said, man, that's way out of my league. <laughs> and he was right. You see, only God can do that. And God says to this church, if you want to fix this, you've got to begin doing what I tell you to do. And number one, he said, you've got to remember. You think it's good to remember some things? Oh, yes. Jesus said on one occasion, in Luke 17, 32, remember Lot's wife. Three words. <laughs> that, that's all he said to him. Remember Lot's wife. You know, there's some valuable lessons that we can learn from that, can't we? She looked back and turned to a pillar of salt. What Jesus means is, serve God looking forward. Don't desire to be that person you used to be. It's good to remember some things. Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. These people, they needed to remember wherefore they were fallen. The second thing they needed was to repent. And He specifically told them, if you do not repent, I will remove your candlestick out of its place. So the congregation had to fix some things or Jesus said, you're not going to be a congregation anymore. Repentance is very important. In fact, in Acts 2 and verse 38, they were told, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Repentance is part of God's plan. But I love this. Not only did they remember, they repent, but they had to react. He said, remember from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. In order for them to get back to their first love, they had to do the first works. And they had to react. You know, in Colossians 1.18, the Bible says that in all things he might have the preeminence. Talking about Jesus, that he will be first. Preeminence means to be first in rank. And friend, if you've left your first love, that's the way you're going to have to fix it. You're going to have to remember that you were fallen. You're going to have to repent of it and then react to it and put Jesus back in His proper place. Somebody said, if God is your co-pilot, you need to swap places. Let God fly the plane from now on. So we see this authority. We see the acknowledgments. Uh, we, we see the, the admonitions. But I like this. Look at the applications here as we close. In verse 7, he said, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Do you have an ear to hear today? Are you willing to take this message and rivet it upon your life and heart and say, You know what? I don't want to leave my first love. I want to do what God says for me to do. And I hope that you will. I hope that I will. And I pray today that if I ever go astray, friend, that you'll come get me. And I hope today that you'll listen to what God has to say. Will you obey the gospel right now? The Bible says in Ephesians 5, 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church, and He gave Himself for it. He gave Himself for it. You know what that means? That's where His blood is. The next verse says that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word, that He might present it to Himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's what God wanted the church at Ephesus to be, a church without blemish. Friend, I beg with you today to obey the gospel so that God can add you to His church. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, the Bible says, They gladly received His word and were baptized in the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. In verse 47, The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Will you do that today? If we can help you, contact us. We love you. Thank you. Until next time. Amen.